So, very pleased to see you here. Um, my name is Tom Glazier, and I'm the, uh, so the first Knight Media Policy Fellow at the New America uh, Foundation, uh, soon to be joined by a number of others, I'm pleased to tell you. Um, we're really pleased uh, to hold this event. Yesterday, we welcomed Jer Chairman Janikowski of the FCC, and today we welcome his senior advisor, Steve Waldman, on St his advisor on media, and Michael Kinsley, the senior editor of The Atlantic. Uh, for those of you not familiar with New America, it's a public policy institute that invests in new thinkers uh, to address and uh, new ideas to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States. Um, the Media Policy Initiative, uh, more narrowly, seeks to provide research policy ideas and enable those in the media uh, policy making work realm and also people more broadly uh, as they think about re creating and transforming media in this rather uh, rough environment. Uh, right now, we are very focused on uh, local media and uh, building on ideas around the Knight Report, informing communities, sustaining democracy in a digital age. Um, we find that's a good starting point. Uh, it really touches on media, not just in terms of production, but in terms of access and engagement too. As a result, we're looking at uh, a set of questions uh, that I think Michael Kinsley will address to Steve uh, Waldman, uh, probably as broadly uh, I I as, as the Knight Report. Uh, they're two fantastic speakers, and I'm sure will engage in a lively discussion um, and hope that the uh, rather relaxed setting provides a, a freer voice, Steve. So. You're not going to tell me what these questions are that I'm going <laughs> to Steve? I think you're... You know, you'll, you have the... All right. The, um, I'll hand over to Steve Cotton in a moment um, to introduce the two of them and share a few thoughts. But first, some housekeeping. This is being broadcast live on the web and archived on our web for future viewing. It is on the record forever. <laughs> or at least until the end of the New America Foundation, whichever comes first. Um, towards the end of the event, I will return to the podium and provide an opportunity for those of you in the room uh, to ask questions, and we have a microphone for that. And for those of you who are not, and I'm looking at the camera, or whichever camera is looking at me, um, please submit your questions through Twitter uh, using the hashtag MPINAF. And with that said, I will hand the podium over to Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and welcome, everybody. I, I only have a uh, brief moment or two to stand in the way of what I think will be a terrific conversation between two journalists I admire a great deal about a subject that is not only something that, as Tom says, we're interested in institutionally at New America, but I think many of us here have a uh, personal interest offline as well in the quality and the content of the discussion that's now going to unfold. This is obviously a time of great transformational change in media and information systems in the United States and globally. Uh, the change has uh, lots of complex aspects, many of them positive and creative. There's also been a destructive loss of professional journalism of type that all three of us practice for at least some of our lives. And uh, both of those aspects of this change have implications for the character of our democracy and the extent to which public institutions are held to account by their, by their citizens and the mechanisms by which citizens can do that. And I imagine that all of that will be part of the conversation that goes on today. Both of the uh, panelists are distinctive, I think, in our profession, not only for the quality of their work overall and the, the leadership they've provided to peers and, and new generation journalists just by the way they've worked and the ideas that they've brought forward, but they're both uh, journalists who started out in the old days. <laughs> and rather ahead of their colleagues moved into the new spaces. And while doing that, retained a, an acute and sophisticated interest in the public policy context around them. So I think that that's part of what brings them together here. Michael, of course, has edited, I think, every publication in American Letters at one time or another, uh, but notably uh, Harper's and uh, remade the Los Angeles Times opinion and op-ed pages to account for the new media age and a new form of discourse. And uh, of course, was the founding editor of Slate, the first 
pure online magazine to make a difference and a partner of New America. And uh, many other things that I won't uh, list just for the sake of time. And then Steve Waldman, who started at Newsweek and U.S. News, was a political reporter, was an editor of the Washington Monthly for a time. And then uh, well before it was fashionable to migrate out of newsrooms to uh, the web world, uh, became the president and editor-in-chief and conceptualizer of BeliefNet, a very important, innovative online uh, journal and network that dealt with journalism about spirituality and religion and uh, public life, and is now, as Tom says, senior advisor to the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. And as you know, at the FCC today, really there are deliberations, decision-making, arguments in public and behind the scenes going on about all sorts of profound sort of intersections in American policy toward telecommunications as well as toward media. There is a big broadband uh, track going on. There are media concentration issues as ever. There are uh, other sectors of the FCC's work that really do feel as if they're at a crossroads. And Stephen's role is to come in and help the chairman think about one of those sectors that is not been a part of Washington discourse for the last 20 years as, say, telecommunications and spectrum policy have been which is to say that there's a recognition broadly, uh, lots of different points of view about it, that journalism is, is in a profound transformation and that public policy is involved in that transformation, if only passively to date, <laughs> and that there's at least an opportunity to think about what public policy might be more constructively to promote a healthy democracy. I think leave it very open-ended that way and let you guys define it. The concrete thing that Stephen has done so far to advance this aspect of the FCC's work is to issue a series of questions for comment, which is the FCC's principal initial investigative method. And those are on his website, as he can talk to you about. And they really do speak to the kinds of themes that Tom referred to that the Knight Commission and others have investigated, but they go beyond them to some extent. And they're the beginning of what I hope will be a process that we'll learn something about today. So with that, the format is you guys can talk to each other, or Michael, I guess, can independently decide what questions he's interested in for about 30 or 40 minutes. And whenever you're wrapping up, Tom can come back and take the audience. Any, anything the I leave we'll out. Talk. Yes. Yeah. All right, excellent. So over to you guys. Thank you. Well, first thing I want to say is we're competing, I guess everybody knows, with the President's Health Care Summit. And I don't know if you watched any of it. I watched it all morning. It is fascinating. And it's a great example of technology enhancing democracy. It's clear that, that, that it's only working because everyone there knows they're on C-SPAN. So they're all on best behavior. And, and um, it's, it's, it's remarkable. So what are the questions that you're supposed <laughs> to be investigating? We could use up uh, three hours just well, Pick your three going, favorites. Going, going on. Well, uh, first, just I wanted to also thank the New America Foundation uh, because some this area of media policy and communications policy has often been um, left only to uh, industry uh, experts and having very sound and very creative public policy discussions around it that looks at questions of the public interest is crucially important and it's great. That you're what is doing this that. area? Okay, so the starting point for this project. Um, is the collapse of journalism or the contraction of certain types of uh, journalism? And specifically, what does that mean for democracy? Uh, it's really, we borrowed some of the language from the Knight Commission report, which talks about information needs of communities. And so while the FCC doesn't and shouldn't have a particular interest in bailing out journalists or particular companies or industries. It does have an interest in making sure that democracy is well served by whatever the system, you know, I was about to say ecosystem, but we instituted a drinking game at the FCC <laughs> where anytime someone says ecosystem, we take a drink, which is why we never get anything done. because um, Drink of water. <laughs> water is okay. So... Um, so, and, and the reason that we talk not only about journalism, but also information needs is partially what get, get gotten at through the example that you 
just gave with C-SPAN. There are all sorts of ways in which information can now be provided directly to consumers that's actually better than you watching that on C-SPAN, you're getting a better sense of that than whatever the article they're going to write about it. Uh, oh, sure. Tomorrow. Well, Fox News, right during the break, immediately said it's, it's health's a popping all day today, <laughs> um, which was not in the spirit of, of, of the event itself. So the, at, at a high level, we need to try to figure out whether these things that are going on in the market, these disruptions, uh, that are affecting things like the uh, provision of full-time professional journalism. Uh, sh are they things we should be worried about? Uh, are these, is this just a transitional moment where uh, the, the market um, will, will fill these gaps, or is there something inherent in the nature of journalism as a, as a public good that makes it something where government needs to be more involved? Um, that will lead directly to another question, which is about what at the FCC is referred to as the public interest obligation. Um, this concept has gotten a little bit lost in the conversations about the media because there's been a bit of a newspaper centrism to most of the conversations about wither journalism appropriately. But, um, and newspapers have no public interest obligation. In a legal sense, they right. have no public interest right. obligation. Um, certainly, particular editors or publishers feel that they have a public interest obligation, but they don't in a legal sense. Mm. That's not true for local TV, local radio, to some degree, cable TV, satellite TV. Um, websites? And, uh, well, websites the, uh, is, is an area of some debate right now. It's the FCC's view that, they that the government and the FCC in particular absolutely has authority over um, what they call the on-ramps and off-ramps to the Internet. Not so much the content of the Internet, but how it's all set up and who can go on it. And that's getting played out in the debate about the open Internet, formerly known, policy formerly known as net neutrality, um, now known as the open Internet and a rebranding huh. re effort. Why? Um, I think no one had any idea what net neutrality uh, referred to. I don't have any idea what the open <laughs> internet refers to. It kind of gets to the question of, um, you know, can ISPs and, uh, you know, whether it's Verizon or AT&T or whoever's controlling, you know, your access to the internet uh, discriminate as to, you know, who gets to have their videos load fast, who gets to have their videos load slow. You could imagine a you know, a situation where if a particular ISP had a business deal with CBS, say, they would say CBS videos load fast, all the other ones load slow, and I mean, that's just one example, but... Uh, or Has do, anyone ever done that? Uh, there have been a couple of examples uh, of this. Uh, there was a situation where, I believe it was uh, the uh, NARAL, the abortion rights group, was prevented by one of the phone companies from sending out text message bulletins to their, uh, to their members for legislative action alert. Um, and there were a couple of other examples like that. And of course, the issue comes up in the, uh, in the proposed merger with, between Comcast and NBC. It's sort of, you know, it's almost the clearest way of asking that question. Um, so the question of whether they, the internet or anyone in the internet has public interest obligations in the same way that the broadcaster did is, is kind of fresh material. And it is one that we'll be, you know, we'll be looking at. Um, what you had over the years was you started off with the commercial broadcast, the local TV stations and the local radio stations having public interest obligations. And it was kind of a clear trade. We're giving you a license for free, and that's going to be worth something. And in exchange, because it's scarce and we're giving it to you and not someone else, you have to do some things for the public. You have to have a certain amount of program, news and information programming, things like that. And I won't go through the whole story history of, of uh, you know, what's happened to that, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's more vague and less strictly enforced. Uh, and there are some folks who, who argue, well, now, you know, we've got... Uh, uh, President Obama's appointment as the 
chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, and just why don't you just get on the, with the business of enforcing this stuff the way it was supposed to be enforced? Uh, the problem is that the world has changed a lot since these rules were devised, and you have all these other media that operate under different rules. Um, and so the way we're looking at it, and our first workshop on this is on March 4th, is what is this, what does the idea of a public interest obligation mean now? Um, and, and that leads to the pub public policy questions of um, what, it, what, is, what should be the public interest obligations of various different media players? How should the government enforce that, if at all? And the way this connects back to journalism is uh, it relates potentially to how much local TV news is produced, how much radio news is produced, whether things like cable or satellite are giving uh, airtime to journalistic entities. You know, there are potential indirect effects into the journalism question. I, want, I wrote a book, believe it or not, decades ago about the FCC and its decision making. It was actually about communication satellites. And at that time, at least, the, the fairness doctrine and the other public interest obligations were a complete farce. And they, and they were, I mean, you got points for, for running community service programs, which they ran at 6 a.m. on Sundays and things like that. And yet they'd been given licenses worth millions. Now, there's two solutions to that problem. One is to start piling on these public interest obligations. The other one is to say, just pay us for the licenses. So uh, wouldn't that even today be, be much better? I mean, the government could use the money a, a lot more, it seems to me, than, than more. Um, and it would, they wouldn't be meddling in things which many people, I think including me, feel it would be better if the government could stay out of. Well, I'm going to be very boring and unsatisfying in, in avoiding giving my opinion on almost any actual recommendation um, <laughs> ahead of time. Uh, but I will say that other people have suggested yeah. things like that. And they're absolutely, things like that are, are absolutely part of what we're going to be looking at. Uh, another idea that we've heard is, um, uh, if not pay it to the government, where it'll just go into the treasury, maybe there's some way of having uh, money is paid into some other entity or system that would actually lead to better journalism or better content. I mean, one example that I've seen is, um, you know, have uh, fees go to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting or, or, or things like that that help public media. And I think we're really in the beginning stages of thinking creatively about this. I mean, the main answer, the main idea that I've heard mostly is, is what I said, is let's come, you know, uh, these public interest obligations, though absolutely right in principle, have been not successful in their implementation. Let's just try to convert that into some cash yeah. and use it for something useful. Um, wh what the useful thing is and how you define that is a big question, but that should be part of what we talk about. Well, there's a couple of things sort of in the air. One is Columbia Journalism School did a report where they said there should be federal financing of newspapers. Um, that's one place you could use the money, I suppose. And actually, this communication satellite thing, um, the origins of ComSat, which was the company that first put up satellites um, uh, for communications, uh, it was federal. It was a federally chartered company um, that was profits were supposed to go to fund public television. Um, this was a Ford Foundation idea, and nothing ever came of that. Oh. Um, I think, thank yeah, goodness, and ComSat has long since been absorbed by some communications conglomerate. I don't remember. So it's too late to grab those profits for <laughs> yeah for for that. Um, you know, Steve Call and I were on a panel a few months ago in, in San Francisco about the future of newspapers. 
you, you can spend your life on panels on future of newspapers. Uh, unlike 15 years ago when you could spend your life on panels on the future of the internet, which was a much cheerier subject. Um, By the way, one solution that has come up to solving the problem is that if you just charged a lot for every conference on the future of journalism, yeah. you would have enough to fund all the journalists in America. But I thought that I, I guess I was on more or less on the side of don't worry about it, it'll sort itself out. And Steve was supposed to be representing the no, 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 they need help. And I felt that we had beaten him down to the point where his position was, well, they may need some help during the transition. Um, ha have you backtracked? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I'm prepared to, allow, to, to accept your summary of my views. But, uh, I, I, actually, let me, let me put it this way. Yes, I think the transition is what's knowable. And, there, and I do have a view that the loss of professional journalism I think Steve had a phrase that I hadn't heard quite that way before, full-time professional journalism. That's measurable. It's significant. It's a matter of public interest. I don't mean it in the legal sense, but in the common usage. And that I would complete my thought by just saying we already have public policy that shapes journalism that is relevant to democracy. We have postal subsidies. We have FCC rulemakings about public interest obligations. We have a whole suite of policies that already exist. So my only desire, which is what Steve, I think, is charged in do, to do, is to re-examine those policies to see whether they can be better in the public interest. And you know, one, in, in terms of this question of whether or not um, how big a problem there is at the end of the day, I think we have to be honest, even those of us who are, who are really quite worried about what's going on, that if you pick up the news, if you pick up the physical uh, print newspaper, and you flip through it, and you look at all the different sections and features in it, the, the reality is that a lot of what newspapers did are being done as well, if not better, by the internet. Um, and you can go through a pretty long list. I mean, uh, news that has announcements, original source documents. It's much better now than it was. Uh, before, hyper-local, box scores, horoscopes, commentary, classifieds, uh, press releases, stock quotes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. And it, it may be a relatively short list of things that are really getting lost. It, it, it also may be a relatively short list of a few very important things, uh, news that institutions don't want to have out, you know, involuntary news. Um, uh, international news, beat reporting, where you need someone who is cultivating both sources and knowledge and expertise, um, you know, boring civically oriented news, uh, journalism that ex assesses competing pieces of information. Um, you know, a lot of, there, there tends to be a little bit of a, when people talk about what we're losing with journalism, everyone sort of always talks about investigative reporting because it's kind of the easiest it's easiest to understand as being something that you know a user-generated blog is not going to deal with, but but that's really only a small portion of what journalists do, and a lot of it is um, well. I'll give an example when a, a very common example that I heard at one conference by the people who say almost all of what journalists did can be picked up by the new uh, ecosystem. Um, uh, an example is you don't need someone covering the school board. There's a room full of a thousand people or 200 parents that are covering the school board. They, you know, you're going to get an incredible wealth of data and reporting on it. Well, I've been to enough school board meetings or PTA meetings to know that sometimes the person who talks up at the PTA meeting is the one who had a fight with the principal, and that's why they're angry, or their kid didn't get into the class that they want, or they have some sort of an agenda. It doesn't mean there's not great information coming from them, but this is a really simple example. One of the pedestrian but really important things that full-time journalists do is sort through competing agendas that sources have. Um, and you know, crowdsourcing hasn't figured out a way of, of doing quite the same thing. Well, but journalists are supposed to be objective, so how can they sort out, um, sort out competing agendas and say that one of them is clearly better than the others? 
or not even report the others? Well, usually they report it, but they do make subjective judgments about who. Well, you could, for instance, report what uh, parent A said, but note that um, parent A is a nut. That parent A, is a, <laughs> parent A, comma a nut, or parent A, whose five children have all been expelled uh, and may carry a grudge. Well, you know, there are th there are three areas that seems to me that people keep saying we're going to lose with newspapers. One is, and and how much we should be concerned about them seems to me is constantly shifting. International news, as you said, investigative reporting, and then hyper-local, which doesn't at this point even exist in, in newspapers. So in terms of hyper-local, it, it's the pressure from the internet that's, that's creating that as a subject, if in fact it ever is, in newspapers. And international, there seems to be plenty of foundations uh, that are willing to send people to Iraq. Um, when I worked at the Los Angeles Times, they actually put notices up in the elevator. Does anyone want to go to Iraq? <laughs> and um, they got, you know, uh, just enough response to keep that open. And then, um, well, those are the three. Well, let's talk about local. Um, to be more precise, I think the problem is not hyper-local. It's whatever comes above that, local-local. Um, because, in fact, hyperlocal is an area where the Internet has improved on newspapers yeah. for the most part. You have uh, newspapers just economically could never get down that deep to a block-by-block block level. And now you have this, gr this growing world that's incredible of you know, block-by-block block blogs and ways that people can contribute or take pictures of the potholes on their street and send it to the city hall. Mm -hmm. So they get, you know, that's amazing. That's stuff that, you know, the city newspaper could never do. But go one level up to who's covering City Hall, who's covering the Education Department, who's covering the State House, who's making sure the Building Department isn't corrupt, uh, things like that are not uh, well suited to you know, uh, citizen bloggers in, in the same way. You don't, I mean, you don't think that there will be some, some person who is obsessed with this, who will put out something that, that will be at least as good as, as um, what newspapers are doing. I mean, most newspapers in this country are awful. I mean, that, that's, that's one starting point for analysis. Isn't, I, wouldn't you agree with that? I think we, may, we can quote you on that, but I don't think uh -huh. I'll, I'll give a, a, a verdict on that. Um, you know, it is, it is a strange thing that, like, I, I spent most of my career, uh, you know, informally as a critic of all the things that newspapers were doing wrong or news magazines were doing wrong or whatever. Um, and now I find myself, you know, ta be, being a little bit of a defender of the good old days when yeah. they were doing all this great stuff. Obviously, the truth is somewhere in between where they're, um, you know, just because they weren't doing... Uh, as much as we wanted to doesn't mean it couldn't get worse. And in truth, uh, the, the accountability journalism that was done uh, by uh, journalists at newspapers uh, did and does form a, a function that is not fully replaced, at least not yet, uh, through, through citizen journalism. Yeah. The best stuff is going to end up being a combination. Of, of these things. You know, the, at a minimum, the user-generated stuff can provide uh, the raw data and, the, and information for journalists. And in some cases, they'll be just as good or better than the journalists. You just can't count on that filling all the gaps. Steve, you live in Washington. And I happen to know from reading the Atlantic Wire what a typical well-educated Washingtonian reads, because Steve Cole wrote a little, uh, provided a little feature to us. And, and you have access to the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And thanks to the internet, everybody in the world now does. But the typical town, imagine 20 years ago when they had to rely on I will get in trouble if, if, you know, almost any newspaper you can name, 
you know, they were nothing that was, seems to me, worthy of tearing your hair out to save. And, um, uh, and furthermore, they, they, they were part of the establishment of, of every city except the very largest and most metropolitan cities, and including some of them, Chicago, uh, for example. Um, and, the, and the nostalgia just seems to me, I mean, look at the San Francisco papers, uh, Seattle, um, they're just, the nostalgia just seems completely misplaced. I guess the, go the goal is to try to make sure we end up with something better than we've ever had before which ought to be uh, some combination of the best that journalism always ha has done. And I do think there are countless, countless examples of, of, of professional journalism and journalistic institutions uh, having profound positive effects on our community, plus the vast improvements that are offered by the, by the new media. And I don't, you know, that should be the goal. Why is the FCC concerning itself with newspapers? Well, we're, the report that I'm working on, because it's a report, not a rulemaking, we're looking at everything holistically. The FCC does not have jurisdiction over newspapers, so we're not considering, nor could we, you know, regulations on newspapers. Um, but the FCC does have jurisdiction over uh, local TV, local radio, cable, satellite, and, you know, much of everything else besides newspapers. Uh, so, um, you know, we do have those public policy tools are, are there and should be looked at. And, you know, when I, when I was asked to do this by uh, Chairman Janikowski, I said to him, like, you know, what if I conclude or what if we conclude that nothing needs to be done? Are you okay with that too? Could be like a one-sentence report. Uh, and he said, you know, that's fine. Um, so we're not prejudging what, you know, what the outcome is. But as, as Steve was saying, if you don't change anything, you're, you're making a decision also. You're making a decision that the current batch of laws and regulations, uh, many of which were written or conceived not only before there was an Internet, but in some cases before there was a TV, um, that those are all still the right ones for this age. And, you know, it could be that some of them are, but the odds that the people, you know, who wrote the, who conceptualized these things in the 40s and 50s were um, that prescient uh, that they were able to anticipate the internet or a day when you're, you can, what, you know, your TV can be in your pocket um, when they were some, in some cases, you know, barely even getting used to the idea of TV. Well, many, many of the policies they came up with at that time didn't even make sense at that time. Um, for example, well, let me ask you whether you think that this is true. All the rules about, um, all, and all the steps they took to make sure that TV stayed local, you know, and then, of course, immediately networks grew up because um, there was no point in TV being local. And there were the rules that required um, TVs to TV stations to be owned by newspapers. Then they decided that was crazy, and they forbade them to be owned by newspapers. And doesn't the FCC have a pretty terrible record overall? I mean, you just got there, so, so, <laughs> so you can... It's not my fault. Yeah. Um, the... It is true that the FCC has had, and I guess I would say communications law in general, has had the view that local is good and that policy ought to be uh, shaped in a way that it encourages, the term is localism, um, but it encourages as much, uh, a healthy amount of the media being owned locally, being geared toward local concerns and things like that. And yes, in the past they took a kind of, you know, the regulatory approaches that the FCC took over the years kind of reflected each decade that they were in. You know, it, it, at one point it was very much about setting very detailed rules and then and that changed. But, uh, but certainly the principle that the media world ought to be attentive to local concerns 
and that ownership of all media shouldn't be consolidated into you know a few national chains. I'll, I'll go out on a limb and say I support that principle. Um, you know what you do about it and how you achieve that goal uh, is another question. You know there's a there's a market argument that it's kind of will, would be in the nature of the way the market would evolve that local stuff will get taken care of because people on a local level care passionately about more passionately about their block than they do about their state, and so that'll draw, you know, people towards it. But I, uh, the the principle of having an emphasis on local is is you know a a long standing one, and as of now, I don't know that we'll be challenging that. One of the things that really used to drive me crazy when I was doing this research years ago about communication satellites, about FCC decisions, was that um, people would file, you know, comments on the decisions. And if there were two companies both competing for something, like a, a satellite license, they would make these arguments that, that the other company was evil and totally disqualified to, to have anything to do with satellites. Then they would merge their proposals, <laughs> and all of those arguments would disappear. Does that, and to me, if I was running an agency, I would say, you no longer get the comment, you know, because you're not, you're not, um, you've shown that you don't care uh, whether it's valid or not. And does that still go on? Well, they, you know, they changed the rules to uh, to have less of that kind of uh, competitive licensing, but it's been I'm you know it's been very hard for the regulators over the year to fig figure out the right way to do that because you did have this license that you're giving away, and uh, in exchange for the stations doing something. So I think the original theory, and I'm uh, not really a scholar on the, the deep history, but the original theory was uh, one way to keep a sense of competitiveness and vibrancy, and so you didn't just have the same people holding on to this license once it was given for once, was to have these challenges. Uh, my understanding is that they then became concerned that it was being gamed and that some, some uh, stations would uh, sometimes challenge someone else almost as an extortion technique, yeah. challenge them, get paid off, or merge, or something like that. And that happens sometimes, so that wasn't the ideal situation. Now we have a situation where, uh, you know, the licenses are, um, you know, I don't know if automatic is too strong a word, but they're, you know, the, the, I, I think if I'm, if I'm getting this right, the FCC has only pulled one license in about the last 40 years on the basis of public interest obligations. So uh, I'm not sure that you know we've totally nailed the system yet, um, and it's it, there is an inherent problem because if you go if you go to the other end and say, well, we want them to have a public interest obligation, we want them to be uh, because it is a scarce resource. It's it is a little different from you know a newspaper or something that's wide open. Only a certain number of people can have the spectrum on the station, so the government has to decide through some mechanism who's going to get it. If you, if you uh, go a pure auction system, then there may not be certain public interest things being filled. If you go the other direction and say, we're going to have a list of things you have to do, um, the list may sound excellent in theory, but the more detailed you get and the more you actually get the government enforcing it, First of all, you have you have potential for bureaucratic silliness, and then on a more principled level, you have the the potential for real First Amendment problems. That the government, you know, no, we don't really want the government going in and dictating what local news TV programs should be saying or doing. So finding the right public policy, you know, way at that is is you know very difficult. But it's it's the it now is the time to revisit all of that because. The system that we had was based on a very different world, and uh, 
you know, doesn't doesn't probably make a lot of sense for where we live now. Is it still true that if you get a license because you've performed some public interest obligation or very often an affirmative action um, standard of some sort, that you can turn around and sell it the next day on the market? I don't know. I, I don't know exactly what the rules are on whether it's the next day or or whatever. But yes, people. Uh, uh, Companies can get a license, and then before renewal comes up, can sell it to someone else. That's not good. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that, too. <laughs> Thank you, Michael and uh, Steve. So we'll now move to oh, if this works. I have a computer with uh, Twitter, so I can see the questions from outside of the room. Um, to a Q&A with uh, the audience, both here and online. And being the moderator, I will take uh, more of his privilege. And um, also being someone who is facing the 42 questions that Steve has asked, I'm very keen, as I'm sure others are, to ask him a few questions. Um, the future of, uh, of media is, is in play in, in many ways. Uh, and I'm, I'm struck by, you know, we're all white men here. And I'm, I'm just sort of conscious that in a, in a, in a world where the La loss of jobs in uh, in newsrooms has disproportionately hit minority journalists, and, and there's real questions of viability of minority media institutions to exist. Whether you have any sp specific thoughts around that uh, area? Um, there are two sides to this. So on the on the one hand, the internet actually should be a very good thing for minority media in the sense that the barriers to entry for new businesses and new sites are lower. You know, if you were if you're talking about a limited amount of TV spectrum and you were a minority and you didn't get in, that was the end of it, right? Um, now there's all sorts of opportunities to create your own um, sites. On the other hand, when you look at the traditional media, uh, the trend is actually in the wrong direction. Uh, the percent, I forget the exact numbers, uh, but the percentage of minority-owned TV stations or radio stations actually going down over time, not up. And uh, some of that has to do with consolidation. Some of it has to do with uh, availability of capital. And that's kind of another topic we're looking at, or actually other people at the FCC are looking at. Um, so it's, you know, that's kind of an inconclusive answer. But uh, the, the encouraging stuff that you're seeing on the internet is somewhat wiped out or counterbalanced by yes. some disturbing trends in some of the other media. Um, can I yes, ask please. I'm I'm totally in favor of affirmative action, but it seems to me that the least justified form of affirmative action, the one that has all the flaws and none of the benefits, is affirmative action for rich people. And the people who buy TV stations either are rich themselves or they're fronts for some white male who's rich. And it seems, and, and those, those, uh, those uh, cases tend to discredit the real, the good kind of affirmative action. Um, I think they, that, that all these things for for minority businesses and small businesses, ought to be ought to be wiped out. What, one of the questions: affirmative action in the communications field is partly about the jobs, but it has an additional element, which is the actual serving of minority communities with media that reflects minority concerns. And the argument has been whether or not you know even if it's wealthy African American businessmen getting TV licenses. If it results in minority communities being covered in a way that they wouldn't be otherwise, then there is a public policy rationale for that. There's debate about that. There's there's debate that says, yeah, you know, the the minority owned media didn't do any better at covering the community than the white owned media, media or conversely that you can have white owned media that does an excellent job of covering it. But that's really the key issue from a, for this particular type of affirmative action in the media world is, 
is what are the policies that are going to make sure that different minority uh, communities are covered well. I'll turn to a question from the floor. The gentleman in green. Thanks. Um, as an Obama supporter, I'm just thrilled that somebody of your caliber is working on addressing these problems. I guess the question um, would be about sort of a grant writing model for filling gaps. If um, And this could apply to a lot of areas where we could give more public initiative, um, you know, to uh, be interested in your thoughts. I wanted to throw out three words because you guys were throwing out concepts of, of, of things that are missing. Um, and I think they would be um, synthesizing, access, and accountability um, because, you know, people can blow off, people in powerful positions can blow people off, but if, if somebody has a platform, um, like the New York Times or whatever, it's a lot harder to blow them off. So, I think those are all, in terms of the sorts of things that, that uh, professional journalism can bring to bear that others might not. And I think one of the questions about the, the new media world is it actually increases the power of public relations and the ability of leaders to uh, shape public perception in some ways. I mean, I just had a, a kind of funny version of this happen uh, that I saw myself. So we, we put out this public notice. Now, I'm not saying this is the biggest news event in, you know, in Washington history. Of for me. It's, <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, there's this world of, of um, the trade press, the, the communications trade press. Perhaps some, some are here today. And there's a lot of them. There's all sorts of niche trade press publications and websites. And so there were probably 20 different items somewhere or another about this public notice. First of all, no one interviewed me um, about it. Secondly, I can't remember how many, but I would say probably about half of the things that were written were direct quotations from the press release we put out, quotes from Chairman Jelly Kaskin. Now, that's great. I mean, now that I work at the FCC, I think that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, I, I've seen this in other, in other venues. And this actually, gets to, this actually gets to another point that I wanted to mention, which is, there, there can be a confusion between the proliferation of choices of outlets and what's going into the product. Um, you can, you can, for instance, you would not want to have a situation where in a particular community, uh, you used to have five reporters reporting into five outlets, and now you have one reporter feeding into 30 outlets. Which, you know, that's sort of an extreme version, but you are seeing that. It's like I, I keep having this visual image of the Play-Doh factory, uh, and you have the big blue blob of Play-Doh, and then you put on that filter that turns it into little streams of spaghetti, mm. and it, you have 20 streams of spaghetti, but it's still the same blob of blue Play-Doh that, that, uh, that went into it in the, in the first place. Um, you mentioned grant writing as a way potentially to subsidize. Now this actually was something that the, uh, the Downey Schutzen report that the Columbia Journalism School put together suggested. Uh, they suggested, I think, on a state level having kind of competitive grants. Um, you know, I don't have a, uh, an opinion on that. Obviously the, the upsides are it's a way of directly funding journalism without necessarily having to do it through, you know, a big subsidy to to major media, media companies that you know, may not deserve um, the help. The downside is obvious that how do you create a process like that that isn't politicized? I mean, if you think Corporation for Public Broadcasting funding Big Bird, uh, when you think of how political that is, you know, if it starts going towards, if it's, if it's funding local news and information, you can, it's, it's, it's not a crazy fear to think that a system could be devised that would be subject to local political control. Um, so are there ways of setting up firewalls or systems that would get around that? I just read an idea, and I'm really just throwing these out because at this point, I think the main thing is sort of stirring the pot and getting a lot of interesting ideas uh, being discussed. Someone proposed a, a kind of a voucher system where you'd have uh, money would materialize. Uh, let's first assume a can opener. First assume um, this pile of money, and then the government gives a hundred dollar media voucher to each citizen. 
And the citizen can use it for whatever they want. If they want to use it for national review, they can. If they want to buy a, a Slate app, I don't know if the Slate apps are or on Kindle. You do charge on Kindle. Um, you can. If you want to give it to public broadcasting, you can. It's sort of an interesting idea because it takes away the question of a politicized board and it pumps money into media. Um, I, I, it would have the disadvantages of all sorts of money going to all sorts of crazy stuff, um, but it, but that's, you know, another way of... I don't, I don't say this in order to discredit this idea, but I believe something like that is, is just happening in France. <laughs> did, did they, <laughs> they're, they're paying for, did, am I making this up? They're paying for students, so I, I saw newspapers and subscriptions. subscriptions, right. Yeah. The, 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 definitely that. Um, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I have two points. One is that doesn't seem to be addressed very often at these uh, uh, sessions analyzing the future of journalism, and that is where are we going to get the talent? Uh, the economics are so terrible. Will the bright people who we were getting into journalism, who began to improve the standards of it, uh, they won't be coming here anymore. They're going to law school. They're not going to journalism school, and they certainly aren't going to risk... Uh, I used to own a small publishing company and we had one intern every year and the brighter they were, the more adamant they were that they were going to go to law school, uh, which was very distressing. The other thing is uh, that we we're going to get some sort of uh, transition. I tend to agree with that. That's the most critical and dangerous period. And there are examples of where governments have moved to help publishing. Um, one was the second class postage rate. That was a subsidy for publishing. And the other, probably more effective and less well-known, was the Commonwealth Cable Rate, established by the British government to protect Reuters, but which in the end became everybody's cable rate. Uh, when I was a stringer in the 50s for Time magazine in Africa, we filed through Montreal, uh, which was stretching it a bit. And of course, United Press had a little sideline, a one-man show called British United Press, so all their world communications could go uh, Commonwealth Cable Rate, which was, I think, about one-tenth of the normal cable uh, uh, transmission price. These were subsidies that worked. Uh, and the one that is the most controversial, and I think the least, uh, the most aggressive, is of course the direct tax in England for the BBC, a tax. And it's called a license fee, but it is a tax. Well, on the question of, of, of um, where the journalists going to come from, in theory, you should be completely right. If economics, if basic economics of supply and demand are, are accurate, but so far, at least in my experience, it has not happened. At the Atlantic, where I've just been working for a few months, they have this constant stream of amazingly talented young people. And the, at the bottom of the stream are interns who were paid nothing. They get $75 a month for the Metro, and that's it. And, and they're just, they're remarkable. Their downside of this, of course, is they tend to be more um, from wealthier families because those are the ones who can afford to do it, although there are some who take another job and stuff. But um, that, that is a more narrow concern. I think the journalism is an addiction that people catch and, and will, will continue to. I it, you know, it may be that journalism becomes, um, I, I remember when I was growing up and I was expressing interest in becoming a journalist and my mom actually had been a journalist in the 50s in Associated Press. Um, and she said, you know, you'll never earn any money doing that, but great, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a noble profession. And for a long time that was the case. And this period that we've had recently where you could both be a journalist and get paid a lot of money is, is a bit of an anomaly. That wasn't really always the way. So it's possible that it will be, being a journalist will be like being a high school teacher where it's something that is viewed as a, a noble profession that you don't get, that you don't get paid for very much. But I do think, you know, that something might be lost there. I mean, to use, you know, the, the, anal the example you're talking about at the Atlantic, I don't know that whether they would admit this, but 
we both used to work at the Washington Monthly at different points in our career. I, I would was, never admit that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, when I worked at the Washington Monthly, I was one day I went and boasted to some friends that I had just gotten a pay raise, and I said, yeah, I'm making five figures now. <laughs> and you have to sort of think about that for a second. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the salary was 8400 uh a year. I don't know if it's gone up since then, but but the you know the reality is that we the part that we would never admit is that we actually probably wouldn't do it if we thought we were always going to get paid eighty four hundred dollars per year. It was a little bit of a ladder that uh, you thought you you know you would have this period at these very exciting publications where you're getting paid not, uh, nothing uh, uh, on the assumption that someday it was going to turn into a job that enabled you to feed your family. So if there's nothing at the end of the ladder, um, that might affect the way this all plays out. I've got a lady in red. Hi. Um, my name is Cheryl Leanza. I work with a number of different public interest organizations, community, public broadcasters. I work with the United Church of Christ. Um, one of the questions I had is in terms of your thinking on this proceeding, you know, one of the issues that Mr. Kinsey brought up a lot was sort of the problems in terms of the FCC's enforcement and its engagement in this issue historically. And I was wondering if you are going to consider at all what sort of internal reforms the Media Bureau might take to actually, you know, if you come up with the fabulous report and you manage to solve our media problems, which would be great. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of great policy on the books now that never sees the light of day. I mean, you know, I'm party to proceedings that are eight and nine years old waiting for the FCC to rule on a rule that's been fairly clear that the FCC has all the resources to do. So I was wondering if you are going to take a look inward at the commission and, and look at what needs to be changed on the inside so that when there are policies, at least they're enforced, at least there's some transparency. There's incredible lack of transparency into some of this internecine stuff with radio and TV licensing. Um, I'm hoping that you might be able to do that. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Well, I, th I think we should. You know, there's, there's an FCC reform process undergoing that the new chairman initiated, but that's on a general level. I think in terms of, of media, if there are things that, um, you know, where the policy is sound but it's not being enforced, uh, absolutely, that should be part of uh, what we discuss. I have both the advantage and disadvantage of uh, I'm probably not going to be at the FCC, you know, five years from now. So um, I, I, that that may uh, make it easier for me to um, deal with some of those issues. Steve. Uh, the questions that you issued in the public notice gave a pretty good sense of the scope of your thinking about what your paper is going to try to cover and analyze and so forth. And some of the questions are informational, looking for clarity about what the nature of the problem might be defined as. And some of them are, in the spirit of what you set up here, a sort of search for innovative policy ideas and ways to thread uh, the needle. But I wondered if you could just elaborate a little bit about the scope of your interest in the big legacy public media institutions that uh, you refer to, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, NPR, others. What, what questions about the future of those institutions, granting that that's only a fragment of the total picture you're interested in, what questions about the future of those in institutions do you think are begged by your input? Uh, well, firstly, uh, just for the for the web audience, it's a question around uh, legacy public media organizations, the future. P public media is going through a very interesting moment right now of rethinking what public media means. We're, we've been using the term public media, which is itself a bit of a uh, a shift. Like we used to talk about public broadcasting, and the fact that we're not saying you know, how are we going to cover public broadcasting reflects the fact that we at least have gotten as far as recognizing that that would be a very limited way of looking at things right now. So, uh, and that gets at one of the, one of the key questions is that we have a public broadcasting system around TV and radio that was built up in the era of TV and radio. Um, so, how should that adapt to the new world where a lot of the most interesting things that are going on out there 
are on the internet or mobile or, or other technologies. On a pedestrian level, should the laws that govern the PBS and, and NPR, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, be changed so that they um, help with non-commercial websites or non-profit websites? Uh, that's a really important question. I mean, so much of the, in the journalism area in particular, but it's all, you know, across the entire internet, there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on uh, among nonprofit oriented news sites. Um, but that's not really the focus of what the Corporation for Public Broadcasting looks at. So that's, that's um, you know, uh, an example. Another example that comes at it through kind of the, the FCC side of it is uh, cable TV. Uh, when cable TV came along, they had had this public interest obligation that related to local broadcasters. Then cable came along, a later technology. They said, well, we'll try to do it a different way. So they came up with the world of public access channels. Um, and those were, that was supposed to be the way the public interest was served in, in cable instead of the other way. So we're, one of the things we're going to look at is like, what happened to that? Um, you know, what has been the, the, the success uh, or lack of success with public, of, with public access as a way we were supposed to get at that? Are there ways of taking, you know, of rejuvenating or, or uh, that idea, maybe marrying it with some of what's going on on, on the website to create something that really encourages um, v valid or viable business models in the nonprofit sector? Anymore. So I'll, in, as the microphone's going to you, I'll uh, just ask a quick question. You, um, uh, you'll get a lot of comments. I mean, you've you've implicated eight dockets of the FCC in your in your 42 questions and gone well beyond the remit of the FCC and in, in terms of policy making. So you clearly have some ambitions here. Um, in terms of data and what you use it, you know, you're going to evaluate these comments in the light of some data. What? How happy are you with the data internally that you've got or access, data that's out there that you're going to build on? It's a good question. You know, part of – one of the side effects of when the FCC deregulated uh, its approach to uh, public interest obligations with TV and radio is it also stopped collecting a lot of data. Um, so there are definitely some gaps. Now, some of those gaps have been filled by independent researchers – and that's something we're right in the thick of right now. We're kind of doing an inventory of what the outside research and the internal research is that has been done to see, you know, to see what the gaps are. And the gentleman. Hello. No, sorry. I'm a member of the trade press that rewrote your press release. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yesterday the chairman of the FCC, I think, was here talking about how the uh, commission wants to set up a process by which TV stations can auction off their spectrum and kind of get out of the broadcasting business. What implications does that have for kind of your work, and do you factor that in at all when you look at what the future of media is going to be if the TV system is different from the way that it's always been, and, and do you have any kind of expectations about what it's going to look like? Well, first of all, you're with Com Daily, right? That's right. Yeah, with Com Daily is absolutely always the exception to the uh, <laughs> to that rule. And if there are any other trade press people here, you're also the exception uh, to that to that rule. Um, you know, I don't want to get too far out ahead of the broadband report, which is going to come out in a, in a few weeks, which gets at this question. Part of part of what we're talking about is that in order to provide universal broadband. There's a strong argument that there, there needs to be more spectrum available for wireless uh, because wireless is a really important way for people to get broadband. And so they're trying to come up with ways uh, of, of making it uh, probably in a voluntary system for, for broadcasters who have these extra, extra bits or, I don't know, that's not the right word, extra slices of spectrum that they got when it was converted to digital. Um, to put some of that back into the pot so it could then be auctioned off. And from the broadband perspective, the point of it is to get spectrum. Get spectrum so that people, you know, so that wireless can be a valid way of giving people universal broadband. 
but it from from a future of media perspective, absolutely, um, we want to do this in a way that makes it more likely that local news and information needs will be well served, and you know that will be uh, that'll be part of what the future of media project works on is to follow up on uh, the broadband recommendations to devise policies that that lead to that. Okay, gentlemen. I think the bike isn't. Significantly more than the average uh, journalist. But my question relates to the public interest obligations of the broadcasters. There's been a significant debate uh, about the problem of uh, the new media parasitizing, free riding, or whatnot on the old meter. Steve Cole, for example, last May spoke at a congressional hearing. That was one of the major themes. What we have not had a discussion about is the problem of broadcast media free riding, parasitizing, plagiarizing the, the, the newspapers. And within the old media, there are very significant uh, plagiarizing, free riding that goes on. So there's a large academic literature on this, on the problem of you know, rip and read broadcasting, uh, that you read the newspaper in the morning, and then you recreate the sources, and then you, you know, rebroadcast it. And one of the arguments is, is this harms local newspapers. Why invest when others can copy? Well, it wasn't such a big problem in the old days, because you got about 18 hours of exclusivity. You'd put the, the, it to bed late in the evening, you'd get the paper out in the morning, the a competition wouldn't see it, and then you'd have 12 hours. But now, with 24-hour news, the newspapers put us out, and it can be copied right away. So this is a significant problem. Broadcasters have been awful. The public is clueless to this. You ask, any, you do any survey, they have the highest trust for local media. Uh, they, they don't perceive the problem at all. So the question is, is there anything we can do to address the problem? Uh, my favorite, my favorite as a political communications scholar's solution would be allow you to actually check to see what the broadcasters have done by providing an archive Sorry. of local media coverage. In other the, words, to the, eliminate the, the question, copyright exemption. I think we've got but, uh, the question. That the broadcasters have, because it's harder to check for this in broadcast media than any other mass media, because they're exempt from the copyright law and providing archives of local TV and radio coverage. Well, first, I hope you'll be submitting that as a comment to the, uh, to, to the proceeding. There's a Federal Trade Commission workshop, uh, not next week, but the following week, that's going to be dealing with some of the copyright um, issues. It, it's a really tough one to get at. I mean, I remember I, when I was a reporter uh, at the Duluth News Tribune in Minnesota uh, one summer, um, you know, turning on the radio and hearing them read my article. It was a, it was a very important article about uh, homing pigeon races uh, in Duluth. Duluth had a surprisingly good homing pigeon racing team. Um, and they didn't attribute it to me. And, and uh, you know, I had those mixed feelings of, of anger that they were ripping me off um, and pride that they were ripping me off. Uh, but the problem is one that you allude to, is that that didn't vaporize the value for the newspaper. The newspaper didn't suddenly have its business model go down the drain because the radio station read my, read my article. So the newspaper, as far as I know, never complained to the radio station that they didn't attribute my pigeon piece properly. Um, whereas in the, new, in the new media system, some of that actually, it matters who gets to ma monetize the content. If, it's, if the content is over here, it gets monetized over there. If people read the content over here, it gets monetized over here. And that's a lot of it. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any bright ideas uh, because, because a lot of it, you know, when people complain about Google News and people, uh, you know, read the headline and don't click into the rest, it's true that that's a, you know, that that hurts the business model, but it's harder to argue that Google is doing anything wrong by doing that. And in fact, that leads to one other point I wanted to make, which is that I've never actually liked the term market failure when it was describing what's going on in the media world. Because a lot of what's happened is kind of rampant market success. 
or, or market efficiencies. You know, we all know, that, I mean, one of the most important concepts in understanding what happened to newspapers is the concept of bundling or unbundling, that the newspaper was this incredible mix of cross-subsidies. And you sometimes hear, you know, the, the horoscopes were subsidizing the City Hall reporter, all sorts of things like that. Dear, ha Dear Abby was subsidizing the I-team, and, and the classifieds were subsidizing the front page. And, you know, it, and it all worked as a bundle, um, in part because they had monopoly status. That helped. Um, and that's all broken apart. Uh, and in one sense, it's like it's way more efficient. I can get my box scores without having to traipse through all this other stuff I don't care about, and for free. I mean, by most standards, from a consumer perspective, that's actually more efficient. Advertisers, it's the same thing. It's like, there's the old saying, half, I forget which ad titan said this, but, uh, you know, we waste half of our ad dollars, but we don't know which half. Well, now you know. Now they know. And so now they're putting it into search, and they're putting it into pay-per-click ads, and it's actually much more efficient. Well, in a way, this is actually very worrisome, what I'm saying. You know, if it was a matter of this is all falling apart because, you know, there's collusion or there's not enough competition, and, you know, you know that would almost seem like a more solvable problem. It's because the disruptions are coming from things actually becoming more efficient and that breaking up the bundling and breaking up the business models. That's what, in my gloomiest moments where I think, there may be something inherent, there may be an inherent problem here where some of this, this sort of civically oriented journalism really may not get picked up by some new business model. I'm not saying I'm there yet, but in the, on those dark days where, I, where I'm thinking that way, it's, it's because of this. It's like the, the logic of the efficiencies of the market are driving um, towards uh, people not having to pay for the boring stuff. It's like it calls the question. How much are you willing to pay for the city hall reporter? And it went, may well be the answer is not much. Um, so, all journalism is plagiarism to some extent. You know, even well, writing a column is is a, which I've done for most of my career is especially um, derivative. You know, I'm so. So uh, I just take one question from the lady at the back. There, yes, you. And I'll then ask Michael for some concluding comments. And oh, whether he's optimistic about policy making the SEC with Steve or not. But, um, <laughs> Just had a couple of uh, process questions. Wondering when you think that the report might be coming out, when you envision completing it, and what else might happen in the process in addition to the public notice and the workshop that's scheduled for next week. And I'm also curious about the interplay to the extent that there is any between the future of media proceeding that you're working on, the quadrennial review at the FCC, and the Federal Trade Commission's journalism inquiry that you mentioned. So I'll take this, the last part. There's a bunch of other things going on at the FCC that, that overlap or uh, rub up against this. There is a an ownership proceeding by, by, by uh, law, uh, the FCC every four years is supposed to look at whether the rules that we have on ownership are still valid. That's like how many radio stations should a particular company be allowed to own? Should a TV station and a, a, radio, a newspaper be owned by the same person in the same community? Those sorts of things. So we're right in the thick of that. Um, and we're, at this point, we're just coordinating. We're not actually totally sure which of, which of us are going to get done first. So we're, we're kind of working together. Um, and that's the case with a number of, of the other proceedings. Uh, the FCC and the FTC are working independently on these two different um, uh, projects. But there's a kind of a natural division of labor. Uh, you know, the FTC workshops in a couple weeks, I believe, are focusing on things like copyright and uh, antitrust and things like that. The FCC proceedings, though our report is going to be holistic and cover everything under the sun, um, we're putting an emphasis on the, the, you know, the, the concepts of the public interest obligation and how that might uh, relate to these issues. Um, I've, been, I've been very careful to avoid actually giving a date on when um, when the report is actually going to come out, but I'm being told now by people at the commission that I can't get away with that for much longer. All we've said so far is this year, 
and I'll stick to that uh, for now. But but uh, sooner or later, we'll, we'll probably sooner we'll come up with a more specific date. Were there any other? There was one other question that I forgot to ask. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. So um, there's there's a, a website that we set up called fcc.gov slash future of media. And we wanted to set this up so that you don't have to, you know, retain a communications law firm in order to submit comments for this. You can post on the website and that counts as a comment uh, for these for these proceedings. Um, and we're really hoping that people do that. There's an interesting, as, as I'm sure um, Michael will attest, when you create a website, usually the thing that you thought was going to be the big hit isn't, and some secondary idea you came up with at the last minute ends up being the big success. We, we threw on this thing in the community area that was basically like, tell us about the media in your community. It's just a message board. And that right now is the most interesting part of the site. It's really, people are just writing, you know, we used to have a newspaper and now we don't, but this blog is great and, you know, our TV station stinks, but our radio station is great. And you're really getting a very interesting, rich contour. So I'd encourage everyone to put in their town and, and um, tell us about that. So we have a workshop next week, and that's going to focus on commercial uh, broadcasting, TV and radio, and then teeing up the beginnings of the conversation of what does a public interest obligation mean in this era. Um, we, haven't we haven't completely set you know, the schedule for the next workshops. I'm, I'm pretty sure that one of the next ones will be on public media. Uh, we're also trying to come up with ways of doing sort of virtual workshops where uh, we'll, we'll be not fully blown uh, sessions within the building, but but ways that people can uh, can chime in uh, online, and um, and then finally is we're doing meetings and interviews. I mean, this is a bit of a surprise to me when I got to the FCC. I just thought like I'm doing a report. That means I'll go and do lots of interviews. And they said, no, it means you're doing a public notice, and you're and you're going to get comments submitted. And we decided we'll do both. And uh, 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 so we're still using some of the informal techniques of actually talking to people directly uh, as a way of gathering information. So, Michael, you final, me to yeah, final we, we, we've, covered, we've covered pigeons in, in Duluth. Um, a little bit of communications policy. Your well, um, as for whether I'm, I sleep better at night knowing that <laughs> Steve is at the FCC, I'm always of two minds when someone I know exceeds to power, as, as seems to happen more now than before. And, and, uh, but I think that um, Steve would certainly be an exception. And the FCC is such an appalling place that it, that it needs him. So with those comments, thank you, Michael Kinsley and Steve Waldman. And thank you for, for attending today. Um, to the person who submitted the question over Twitter, Brett Glass, I will put that question to Mr. Steve Waldman, and I hope he will blog about it on his website. So thank you, and uh, have a good day.